So about six or seven months ago, I made a switch from scanning all of my film on a 35 millimeter Pack-On Plus over to DSLR scanning. So I have a whole rig set up that I, I use actually a, a Canon 5D Mark II. Uh, it's an older camera, I use the 100 millimeter macro. And I get a lot of questions over on Instagram about just the whole process from start to finish. So in this video, I wanna cover three different things. First of all is the whole rig that I've built to hold the camera, to get the scans, everything like that. The second part of this video will be about the actual scanning process, the settings that I'm using, what I'm using to make sure that my scans are within a, a good range to work with. And then the third part of this video will be about jumping over on Lightroom. How do I actually work with these files in something like Lightroom? It doesn't have to be Lightroom, but that's the program I use. That's the program I'll show you. So without further ado, we're going to jump into this video. It might be a little bit longer, but I'm going to break down everything I could think of to show you as fast as possible how I'm using the Canon 5D Mark II to get amazing, amazing scans. I would even say the sharpest, largest scans I've gotten from any process that I've used for at-home scanning. So as far as the whole setup of what you're going to need in order to make the, the same you know, rig and setup that I have, I actually got the initial bare bones idea of this from a video I'll link to up here from a, a channel called Grimes Brothers. It's the only video that they did over on their channel. They had a very similar setup to what I'm using. I built it based off of what they showed, but I made some tweaks to the whole setup to help expediate the process and to use a little bit more uh, easily salvageable or easily found items. And those items can actually be purchased at any hardware store out there. Uh, I actually went to Home Depot. I went in there, I got a six inch square drain grate. Uh, you'll find it in the garden section. Uh, and then after that, I jumped over to the plumbing section where I got a three inch PVC TW coupling as well as a three inch flexible coupling. Both of those things are found in the exact same aisle, at least in the Home Depot that I went to. It doesn't have to be Home Depot. You can go to essentially any hardware store. They should have these things. Uh, I'm going to link to the products down below. I have no affiliation with Home Depot, but just in case you're, you're struggling to find some of these parts or struggling to find these specific parts, there'll be links down below. And the whole setup here, if you could see, is, is the three parts kind of go together like so. Uh, this whole thing sets on the light table, which I'll talk about here in a second. Um, but the, the PVC coupler goes into the top of the drain grate, and then the flexible coupling piece goes over top of that as well. And then also, if you look in here, you could actually see, hopefully you could see, the lens hood for the 100 millimeter macro actually fits in this extremely, extremely well. This is why I made all these adjustments and, and chose some different items to use versus what they were showing over on the other video is because after all is said and done, this fits together absolutely perfect. Uh, I did cut this down about two inches, the PVC coupling. That way the, the camera could set a little bit lower. It fills the frame. I'm utilizing the whole 24 megapixel uh, sensor, which I'll show you when we get over to Lightroom. Um, but essentially, that's it. A couple other adjustments that you're going to make is when you get a film carrier. So this is from, a, I believe, a Plus Tech scanner. Um, I'll link to this down below as well. But there's some notches on the bottom that we cut out here uh, to where this, this film carrier actually slides perfectly underneath. So this can actually slide on top of the light table. I've added some little guides uh, all the way through with just some standard like balsa wood, like modeling wood. Um, you could use whatever you want. You could use a straw, anything that would go the entire length that allows you to actually guide it from one side to the other to where you're not searching once you get in there to try and find the hole on the other side. Um, but all in all, that's, that's the whole setup. Uh, the only other things apart from this is the light table. I'll link to that down below. I got mine on eBay. Uh, I would say that if I were to do it all over again, and I probably will be upgrading this light table in the near future, is this light table is kind of dim. So when we get to the settings portion of this video, I'll talk about how uh, being so dim, I'm actually at about 1600 ISO on the 5D Mark II, which doesn't necessarily hurt uh, a whole lot, but at the same time, keep that in mind when you're 
looking for a light table, you might want to find something that's a little bit more bright. Uh, other than that, if you see here, the, the 5D, once, the, uh, once it locks in onto the lens hood, uh, I know that the, the video is kind of zoomed in, but you could actually see to where it, it sits absolutely parallel to the film plane going across. So uh, the, the thing I love about this setup is I don't have to adjust a uh, tripod or anything else every single time I go to scan. If I take the 5D to go photograph something else, I could come back and put it right on the top and I know it's gonna be perfectly square and level compared to the film plane going across. So it's super quick and easy to set up, to tear down, and to just leave set up on my desk over here. And typically the 5D is still on it and then I just put like a little bag over top of it to keep the dust off. Another thing to, uh, to keep in mind is I also use these Yongnuo RF603C2 uh, flash receivers, but I use them as a, a radio trigger. Um, and I like using these versus a, a standard like radio trigger. In fact, I could probably just use this as a trigger cable release. Um, I like using it in this formation because I can not touch the camera at all and it releases any kind of shake that I might be introducing by holding the trigger off to the side, connected to the cable, anything like that. It allows me to tr trigger everything remotely and wirelessly, and, uh, and I just, I prefer that whole setup. We already had these for old flashes that we had back in the day. You don't necessarily have to buy these. You could use the um, timed shutter release on your camera, anything like that. There's multiple different ways around going through that, I just wanted to let you know that these are what I'm using, at least for my whole setup here. So once again, to break down everything you need, you need the film holder, the uh, storm grate. Actually, I failed to mention that there's a grate in here that you normally take out. You would unscrew and take out. It comes out super easy, but you need the, the six inch uh, square drain grate. You need the PVC coupler and the flexible coupler. You also need uh, you know, whatever lens hood that you have. If you're not using the 100 millimeter macro uh, from Canon, you may have to find another solution in order to hold your lens hood down there, but there's all sorts of solutions. If you bring your lens hood in with you to Home Depot or wherever you go, I'm sure you could find another solution to make sure that your camera is held in there perfectly square. You don't have to build something like this. I mean, you could do this entire setup with putting your camera on a tripod, holding the tripod over top. I just like that with $15 worth of materials, I can build something to where I can set it and forget it and then, you know, just quick run and gun. If I'm using the camera for something else, I could quickly attach it on and then I'm ready to go without having to adjust any kind of tripod or anything like that. So to cover the actual settings that I'm using when scanning the film, first of all is I'm turning the light table up to its max capacity so it's as bright as it goes. And with this light table, that leaves me at 1600 ISO on the 5D Mark II. It's part of the reason why I want to get a different light table is to be able to lower that ISO down to have a brighter light table. But 1600 on you know, a camera like a 5D Mark II, even though it's an older camera, it's still full frame. It's still giving me very, very clean scans. Then I'm setting over to 1 60th of a second. I choose to personally change between different apertures versus changing my shutter speed. I'm trying to expedite the process as fast as possible when scanning film. I shoot a lot, so I want to be able to get a lot covered in a shorter amount of time. I find that 1 60th of a second allows me to scan an entire roll at about 10 to 12 minutes per roll. Um, so instead, I'm changing over from f2.8 to f11 depending on the frame on the film. So if I need to go brighter, I'll, I'll bump it up to f2.8 or f4 or something like that. If I need to darken it down a little bit, I'll go down to f8, f11, somewhere in there. I've done tests and I've, I've checked the scans between f2.8 and f11 and there really isn't that much of a difference. There's no difference compared to my eyes um, that, that you would really even see. So the fact that your DSLR is parallel um, to the actual film plane means that even at 2.8, that sliver of a, a focus is still flat all across the board. So you're still able to get extremely sharp and even scans across the board at f2.8 just as much as you are at f11. So personally, I don't worry about that too much. 
For some other people out there, it might be a deal for you. So maybe you want to go over to one second, uh, you know, shutter speed in order to, you know, bring that aperture up and, and you know, increase your depth of field, increase your sharpness, whatever you might look at. Um, as far as my tests and as far as the results that I'm seeing, I really don't care if it's at f2.8 or if it's at f11. I'm just using the aperture I need to use for the job at hand. Sometimes I might go from 1 60th down to 1 30th of a second, but uh, on the 5D Mark II with the live view, I'm using live preview mode, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. On live preview mode, it caps me at 1 30th of a second. I can't go any lower than that without turning the preview mode off, and I just prefer to leave it on um, specifically for uh, focus and then also the histogram. I'll talk about those in a second. The other thing is I'm setting it to manual focus. So as I'm on live view, I'm focusing in on that green and making sure I'm getting as sharp of image as possible. Uh, you can do it one of two ways. Being that you're on a flat plane, you can focus on one frame and then shoot the next three or four frames on that focus and then refocus. Um, the, the focus does not shift that much. Uh, and the, the change in focus does not shift that much. You would actually be hard pressed to be able to tell a difference when you're actually looking at the scans. I'm a little bit more of a stickler, so I'm refocusing every single frame, but I'm still able to get these uh, rolls of film shot and, and scanned within 15 minutes or less. I'm telling you, it's so, so fast. You get into a, a habit. I'm watching YouTube videos while I'm doing all this. It's so fast uh, that you don't even have to worry about it. The other big thing is while it's on live preview and live view mode, I pull up the histogram. This is, I, I did a lot of trial and error on finding out how to get the best possible scans. And the thing that I've found, at least for my type of work that I'm shooting, is those, the histogram, when you actually look at the histogram, those last two bars, if I put the highlights of the actual digital photo within those last two bars, what happens is when it inverts, is the highlights become the shadows and it gives me nice deep shadows. Uh, it also gives you a very flat scan, so don't worry about that. You have plenty of latitude in there. But once we get over to the scanning section, I'll talk about just the crazy amount of latitude that you're giving yourself when you do scan in this way. So whether or not you like my type of editing style or anything like that, I do suggest if you put that just before it's about to blow out the highlights on the actual digital file, you'll actually have quite a bit of room to work with and you'll open up the latitude of the film that much more. I'll explain that when we get over to Lightroom here in a second, um, but I just wanted to point that out. Using the histogram gives you very, very good assurance as to knowing when you're gonna be properly exposed in your scan of the image. The beautiful thing about this whole setup is you can make individual shifts and changes per frame that you're scanning. You don't have to rely on some sort of software to make the calculations. If you want, and I do this every once in a while, you can bracket some frames. I might do you know, two stops underexposed, two or one on, and, and then a stop overexposed, whatever it might be, just to see what it's gonna look like. It's an extra 10, 15 seconds at the end of the day, uh, and, and it gives you a lot of latitude to be able to, to test and see different things. Lastly, I wanna jump over to Lightroom and show you guys a little bit of my editing process, show you guys how I invert those images over in Lightroom, and how I built a preset that I apply on import that gets everything to about a base scan that I could then work with and tweak and tune to the best of my ability. So let's jump over to Lightroom. I will show you guys that process right now. All right, so here we are in Lightroom. I'm using Lightroom 5, but really any of the Lightrooms that you're using will work perfectly fine for these types of edits. Uh, I have three different images here that we're gonna run through pretty quick. I wanna keep this video as concise as possible. I wanted to show you this one first to show you before I cut off the two inches on that PVC coupler, I wasn't utilizing the full 24 megapixels of the sensor on the 5D Mark II, so I had to crop down quite a bit. So I just wanted to show you what it looked like for the scans before I actually made the adjustment to get much tighter crops. If you look at this one, we'll talk about this image here in a second. But despite not utilizing the full sensor, you could still see how large these images are and how detailed these scans are. You could see where our sharpness is just tack sharp. We're getting beautiful, beautiful definition in the grain and tons of detail. So I'm gonna apply the preset that I built and uh, this gets applied on import. So typically by the time I'm seeing my scans, this preset has already been applied. So I'm seeing a positive image. 
um, but I wanted to show you guys what the negative images look like and in how we're going to get them to a positive image. So I'm going to break down this whole preset, show you exactly what I did um, to build this. Keep in mind that this preset is based off of my histogram being where it is that I showed in the previous segment. So the highlights being where they were on that digital scan, that's going to bring me to this point. And this gives me a good base scan to work off of and bring my black points, my white points, my shadows, highlights anywhere I want them. And I'm going to show you that here in a second. But to show you what we did in this preset, originally you're scanning with a color sensor. Um, so you can see here we have a little bit of a, a green hue. Switch it over to black and white. I'm going to bring it down here first. So in order to, if you see, we started off with a inverted image because we're scanning a negative and we want to bring it to a positive. This is where that magic happens. So it's in this tonal curve area where if I turn this off and then turn it back on, you can see this is where we get the, the positive image. If I turn this to a linear frame, you can see our, our white points and black points have inverted. So if I go back to our preset, you can see it's the opposite. What we did here was we dragged the highlights down to the bottom, we dragged the shadows up to the top. Once we get those points inverted, that's when we get our inverted image. So that's where that magic happens. Then if we go up here, one of the things I'll point off right off the bat is we're still working with a negative image. So if I move our exposure, you'll see the exposure going down actually brings the exposure up and the exposure going up actually brings the exposure down. So everything in here apart from contrast is inverted. So our highlights are actually now our shadows, our shadows are actually now our highlights, our white points are now our black points, and our black points are now our, our white points. So as you're editing this, when you're bringing your white points around, you're going to realize, oh wait, I'm actually editing the shadows or the black points, and you have to keep that in mind when you're going through. But once you've done this for a couple weeks, you'll start to actually think inverted. The workflow gets much faster after you wrap your mind around what's actually going on in this panel. So I bump my contrast up to 80%. I like punchy images. If I bring the contrast down, you'll just see uh, that's what it's doing is it's bringing the highlights, bringing the shadows down and, uh, and really getting that base contrast. And then I'm also adding contrast down here by bumping my whites up plus 50, which is actually bringing my blacks down and then bringing my blacks down negative 50 by bringing my whites up. I know that's confusing. You might have to watch this video a couple times. Once you actually have scans that you're working on and you're playing in this system, you'll be able to wrap your mind around it that much easier. So plus 80 here in the contrast, my highlights are negative 75. My shadows are negative 25. And then my whites are plus 50. My blacks are negative 50. I add plus 10 into the clarity. What this does is mid-tone contrast, which is really affecting our grain in our scans. Uh, if I zero this out, you'll see what it's actually doing is just adding a little bit of sharpness in that grain and allowing me to get a little bit more definition. My details down here, this is the last part of the preset that I have built, um, and this is just the sharpness. My sharpness is at 20% amount, uh, the radius is 1.3, and then the details is set at 90. This may vary and probably will vary depending on what camera you're using. And actually, if we look at this scan, uh, I could actually probably bring my radius down, my amount up a little bit and get a little bit more sharpness out of it. So before I go into print, I, I typically jump over here to the sharpness and make sure that um, the scan, because they really can vary depending on what frame, depending on what film you're shooting, you know, all of those kind of things are, are variables in this whole process. So I go and I tweak that before I actually go to print. So also, I don't remember if I mentioned this, but this is Jacob and Anna Murphy. They're close friends of ours uh, from New York. They're both amazing, amazing film shooters. So if you're not following them on Instagram, I highly suggest going over and, uh, and giving them a, a follow and checking out some of their work. Now, if we jump over to this next image, uh, I'm going to apply our preset here. You'll see the image is actually a little bit darker. Uh, I didn't follow my rule of putting my highlights in between the last little bit of my histogram. So I actually crushed my highlights down, but I want to show you how much detail and how much information we've retained here in the image. So I'm going to actually jump up here. We're going to go to the exposure. So if you watch his face, if I bring our exposure down, which if you remember, brings the actual exposure up of the positive image. Once I start adjusting this, you can see we've retained a ton of detail in his face. We could actually bring the exposure up quite a bit and save a lot of that detail. 
if I uh, reset our exposure here, you can even see here in the, the shadows, we could start to bring up a ton of detail. Uh, this signage around whatever this, uh, this marquee or, or bulletin board or anything, I could bring a lot of that detail in bring our shadows down we could work this image um, a ton to really you know capitalize on on a lot of our, our latitude of the negative up here once we've made this adjustment you need to realize that our base scan is still there we still have a ton of detail so I exaggerated this uh, exposure quite a bit just to show you this if I bring my exposure up on my paintbrush um, we're actually going to start dodging and burning here. You have to realize again, these are all backwards. So when I bring the exposure up, I'm actually bringing the exposure down as I'm painting in. But if I paint in over here, I could go in the highlights of all this. We're going to exaggerate this quite a bit. But you could see, if I just paint in here, we still have all of this detail. You can see here, we still have all of the grain, all of the, the, you know, information that is is just lying dormant waiting for us to reveal so in that hard rock cafe sign up there obviously i would not do this for any reason but i just wanted to show you if we uh if we bump our exposure back down all of that detail is still locked in there so we can bring it all the way down to see where all the detail is here all of our highlights are maintained if we bring it all the way up you can see how much of our shadows we've actually maintained in his, underneath his hat in his mouth, all these different things. So anyways, there you have it. That's the editing workflow uh, of these scans. You might have to go back again. Uh, it starts to get a little complicated at first of wrapping your mind around some of the settings being reversed. But once you actually have some of these files to start working with, it gets that much easier to really wrap your brain around what's actually going on over on Lightroom. So if you have any questions, first of all, you could go back, you could rewatch some of the video. Otherwise, feel free to leave those in the comments down below. Hit me up over on Instagram, ask me any of those questions. I would love to answer those. I don't have this whole workflow in, you know, in its perfect form yet, but I've been playing around quite a bit over the last six to seven months and, uh, and have really worked through some different things. So uh, hopefully I'll have an answer for whatever questions that you might have. Um, but then experimentation is also a big, big part of this whole thing. Uh, a lot of these pieces can be changed. You don't have to use a DSLR. You could use a micro four thirds. You could use your phone. You could use all sorts of different things, but essentially what we're talking about here is just a digital scanning with some sort of camera workflow uh, that will really work across the board. The setup can be changed to work with medium format. The setup can be changed to work with large format. I specifically mainly shoot 35 millimeters, so that's what I wanted to talk about in this video. But with a little bit of tweaking, you could scan pretty much anything you're working with. You could also do scans of Polaroids, of Instax. If there's anything that I didn't cover in here, I guarantee you with just a, a, you know, a minute or two of sitting down going, how would that look? I promise you'll be able to figure it out. Also, if you were doing color film, uh, I know I didn't cover any of that. There's a video I'm gonna link up top here. A, a good friend of mine, Hashem from Pushing Film, actually released a uh, DSLR scanning video, ironically, this weekend as well. Uh, and he talks specifically about a color workflow. Um, so this is very much about the black and white workflow. This is very much you know, a very specific process. But if you're interested in scanning, in uh, color negatives go check out his video also check out some of the other videos on their channel they're doing absolutely amazing things over there i absolutely love pushing film i love hashem and in the whole gang over there and what they're doing so go give them some love if you're not subscribed to them yet i highly highly suggest following along with their channel lastly a huge shout out to our patron family you guys are making videos like this possible and uh and really helping to catapult the uh the channel and the community to a next level so thank you guys. If you want to find out more about the patron efforts, you could go over to patreon.com slash Nick Exposed. Otherwise, I'm going to cut this off. This video has already been long enough. We covered a lot of ground. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Give it a like and, uh, and subscribe if you want. Check out some of the other videos on the channel. We cover a ton, a ton of stuff. Everything from um, just a couple gear reviews, but mostly the creative process and thought process behind our artwork, behind zine making, exhibition making, all that kind of stuff. So go check it out. I love you guys. I will see you guys on the next video. Until then, go and push yourselves two stops. Peace.